welcome to another exciting edition of Six Patterns of Pulmonary Pathology. I'm Kevin. And I'm Max. We'll be your hosts for this session, and we're going to be talking about 25 important pearls in pulmonary pathology. This happens to be pearl number two. two. So, we are going to be looking at a very special type of lung biopsy. Many of you may have seen them in conferences, but maybe not in your own hospital. This is a patient who underwent cryobiopsy. That sounds fancy. It does. It does. It makes me, it gives me chills, actually. Get it? Cryo? <laughs> so, <laughs> the cryobiopsy is a fascinating new technique in pulmonary medicine in which a probe is inserted in the lung and a bit of lung is frozen into a, an actual ball of ice and removed and dropped straight into formalin in the Bronx suite. So a lot of times pulmonologists who learn to do this technique, which is scary to do, will apply it across all kinds of diseases. And every once in a while, they'll actually do, apply it to a case where the cryobiopsy is the absolute answer to the case. And this is a case like that. This is a 19-year-old man who presents to the emergency room with progressive shortness of breath. He's profoundly dysmic at rest. Over the next few hours, he collapses and is admitted to the intensive care unit. His pulmonologist is one of those people who's trained to do cryobiopsy. Goes in, does cryobiopsies, and sends them and I get these cryobiopsies in my community hospital. And I'm looking at them, I'm saying, you know, I feel a lot of pressure. If I get a great transbronchial biopsy, the forceps biopsy, I feel pressure to make a diagnosis. When I get a biopsy like this, this is like a mini wedge biopsy. Absolutely, that's a great way to describe it, a mini wedge. So, mini wedge, many possibilities. We get to see the lung in its absolute native state. Now, once the freeze occurs, the lung is frozen in time, and it only starts to collapse once it thaws in the formalin. So the blood in the arteries was actually frozen in the arteries in their distended state. But when the freeze ball starts to thaw in formalin, the vessels will collapse somewhat. Not as, not as bad as the transbronch forceps biopsy. And they're not crushed like the transbronch forceps. Exactly. No crush artifact, no freezing artifact. Everything is beautiful. So I'm looking at this biopsy, and I see inflammation. Yep. Too many blue cells here. They look a little nodular because I see some blue here concentrated, and I look around it, and it's less. That looks to me like one or two or three or four little tiny nodules here. Right. Coalesced to a bigger nodule. There's inflammation out in the surrounding parenchyma as well. Yeah, even, even out here, it looks like a little bit expanded, right? Yep. yep. So I get into, this is to me is pattern three until I find something acute. And remember, the acute patterns override all other patterns. So no matter what I think this is, if I find acute injury, neutrophils, fibrin, organization. What? Organization. That's polyps of organizing pneumonia. Polyps of organizing pneumonia. Yep. I'm going to override an NSIP diagnosis in the cellular pattern. But that's kind of where I'm heading here. So we're looking around. There's a little organizing pneumonia. It looks real fresh. Looks it's really fresh. And fibrin around the edge of it. So I think this is like an acute and organizing lung injury with a background of a more chronic inflammatory process that's nodular. Now, Max, you know my feeling about nodular disease in the lung that all nodular diseases are airway-centered. Airway-centered. And people say, you know, that's ridiculous. How is that possible? It has to do with the three-dimensional anatomy of the lung. When you see a nodule, it's gathered around a structure. That's just, that people say random nodules. The only randomness about nodules is we're looking at a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure. So you may not see the structure. True. But trust me, if it's nodular, it's most likely airway-centered. So if this is airway-centered chronic inflammatory infiltration with a superimposed acute and organizing injury, this is, this is going to be weird. And one of the beauties of a cryobiopsy is that it samples enough tissue to let you understand 
the, ana the microscopic anatomical distribution of the disease process. We almost never get to see that in transbronchial cryobiopsies. No. You get a little nibble, and there's not enough tissue there of the lobule to know, are we at the periphery of the lobule? Are we at the center of the lobule? Right. But cryobiopsy is tremendous because it gives you a hint to that distribution of disease. It's a snapshot, and it comes from the mid-lung. Remember, the transbronchial biopsy, they want to aim for the same area, but it's harder for them to know where they are. The cryobiopsy, it's critical that they not be too close to the hilum and not too close to the pleura. So you're getting kind of mid-lung snapshot of what's going on in this patient. It's just a spectacular, phenomenal case. So what is it? Spectacular. <laughs> now, some people would look at this not appreciating the subtle organizing process. Yeah. And they would call this nonspecific interstitial pneumonia because yeah. there's a relatively, it's relatively, we talked about the airway-centered accentuation, but it's a relatively diffuse process expanding the interstitium and a little bit of an inflammatory cell infiltrate. Yeah. And this is not an uncommon challenge that we see people run into, that they see an acute lung injury process and they think maybe this is cellular NSIP. Right. When in reality, this is an acute lung injury process. Right. So... We, now we have to decide what is the differential diagnosis for this. If and we say it's acute on subacute? Acute yeah, on acute. subacute. But let's back up one second. Fundamental concept here. Anytime you see centralobular nodules, right. right? You mentioned centralobular, it's around the airway. But what does that tell you physiologically about the disease process? Inhalational. Inhalational injury. So immediately when I'm thinking inhalational injury, I'm thinking, okay, aspiration, yeah. drug toxin, inhalation, yeah. hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, like in, inhalational injury, right? Smoking and more chronic injuries. Smoking and other chronic injuries. So that's what you have to remember is when you see this. What about aspiration? Did you say that? I said aspiration oh, first. Cool. You weren't listening. Jeez. Good job. <laughs> But when you see that centralobular lesion, you should think about inhalational diseases. Yeah. Now, you told me this was a young patient, right? right. And this is a young patient. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of clinical history at the time, but we were looking at this and we were commenting on exactly what Kevin has described so far. This is an acute lung injury process with a little bit of a cellular interstitial infiltrate in the background. And we notice here in the air spaces that there is a lot of macrophage accumulation. And these aren't your grandma's smoker's macrophages that have that fine stippled pigment of smoker's Your grandmother smokes? <laughs> Didn't all of our grandmothers smoke? <laughs> but these are foamy, vacuolated macrophages. And we've recently seen this, this uh, an epidemic, and the CDC's reported on this epidemic, of the electronic cigarette or vaping-associated acute lung injury. And that's exactly what this case is. This is a case of valley vape, vaping associated acute lung injury. And this was a young man who was vaping. He recently increased his vaping habits significantly and he developed this acute subacute respiratory illness requiring admission to the intensive care unit. So were you able to discern that? Because when I sent it to you, I was not aware that this guy was using electronic cigarettes. Right, so it's a combination, again, the clinical pathologic correlation, right? We have a acute, subacute, acute lung injury process. It looks like a toxic reaction. We've got a lot of accumulation of foamy macrophages. We've been seeing this going around uh, in the United States and in the consult practice. And so you pick up the phone and say, hey, is there any chance this young man is vaping? And that's an excellent point because if you didn't know that he was vaping, and you knew his age, and you saw this pathology, do you think you might go back to the clinician and say, you know, I'm wondering about a vape injury lung. Or I'm wondering about an inhalational disease process. Right. You can get to an acute lung injury inhalational disease process just from this biopsy. Right. So people will ask you in, tomorrow when you're at work, you know, have you ever seen any of these e-cigarette cases? Have you ever seen this? vape associated lung injury and now you'll be able to say I have. Indeed I have. So the pearl that this case highlights is about cryobiopsies. 
And the beautiful thing about cryobiopsies is that cryobiopsies are much better than transbronchial biopsies because of what you, we've just showed you. There's not a lot of artifact, and you get to appreciate the anatomical distribution of the right. disease process, and it right. gives you insights into the pathophysiology. So cryobiopsies, better than transbronchial biopsies? As good as surgical wedge biopsies? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Probably not. But a great substitute, because a surgical wedge biopsy is a pain, and it's expensive. A pain for the patient, patient or yeah, the surgeon? Uh, a pain for the patient and a pain for most pathologists who get them, <laughs> who don't like to read them. But the, the cryobiopsy is a great surrogate, a great stand-in, because there are very few diseases with cryobiopsies like this that you can't get extremely close to the diagnosis. And, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to talk to your clinicians about the clinical presentation, because you've got a ton of information here with these biopsies. For sure. So, pearl number two, the cryobiopsy. Better than transbronch, not as good as surgical wedge biopsy. So, we hope you, you uh, have enjoyed this case. Don't forget to like and comment below, and have a good one. Thanks a lot, Max.